you enjoyed your lunch and your conversations. Um, we're going to move on from culture in a networked world to culture and investment, and we're going to hear from a number of uh, keynote speakers and contributors. Uh, the first is the founder and chair of the advisory committee of Theatre Mundi, Professor Richard Sennett OBE. Uh, Professor Sennett will set out what he thinks the economic and political challenges are of investing in people, buildings and cities. And he'll be joined, I hope, by Skype, or on Skype, on the big screen, by Elizabeth Diller, founder of Diller, Scofidio and Renfro USA. Elizabeth is the architect responsible for the renovation and reclaiming of the High Line in New York, which was a, a previously disused industrial wasteland. It now attracts 7 million visits a year. So, Professor Sennett, if you can come up and join us, and hopefully Liz Diller will be on our screens in a second. And we, we have a plan B hope. and a plan C, just in case this doesn't. Uh, well, it's a great honor to speak at this year's Edinburgh International Culture Summit, so ably organized by Jonathan Mills and his dedicated staff who never seem to sleep. Uh, I've been asked to lead off this session on investment in culture. Uh, putting money into concert halls, museums, or theaters seems obviously good for a city or a nation's balance sheet. Such investment attracts tourists, who in turn activate a whole supply chain of activities, from restaurants and hotels to modest crafts which flog mementos. But this kind of tourist-orientated investment is not necessarily good for artists, and indeed can stifle the culture of a city. And I'm just going to take a few minutes to explain to you uh, why I think this is so. It's news to no one that inequality is increasing in the global economy, in those places where economic growth has become intense. We usually think about such inequality in terms of the obscene amounts of capital controlled by those at the very top 1% or even 0.1%. Meteoric expansion at the top has in the last 30 years been paralleled by income stagnation and declining social mobility in the middle or lower middle classes. Now, most artists are part of that stagnant middle. Of course, there is a global circuit of musicians and visual artists whose fortunes resemble those of Goldman Sachs bankers. But artists who live a more civically orientated and modest existence have seen their fortunes decline in the last 30 years. A team of my students, for instance, analyzed a few years ago the economic condition of visual artists in New York City, finding a steady decline of income from the sales of their art, even as the incomes of the global artist elite expanded exponentially. The number of shows and galleries for artists under 30 shrank by 40% over a 25-year period. Rents on studio spaces tripled or quadrupled in the same period, forcing many artists to abandon the city in order to pursue their work. Now, the, such findings uh, suggest that there is a kind of zero-sum game at work in culture, just as in investment banking. What the elite gains, the mass loses. This zero game has ruled, for instance, the city of Hamburg, which over a decade spent more than 700 million euros to build the Elbe Philharmonie Concert Hall. It's a vast project jutting out into the port of the city. The structure has indeed successfully attracted tourists from around the world and global brand musicians. But there's no money left in the city's budget uh, for support of youth orchestras, for studios in which young artists can work, or for the semi-professional choirs which once fanned out over the Hanseatic League. How can we get out of such a zero-sum game? I, the argument I want to make to you is that writing the balance means investing more in producers 
and less on distributors. Moreover, we need to think about how to encourage communities of practitioners, not focus on individual artists. The writer William Empson once declared, the arts result from overcrowding. And that means that a community of people who do different things, speak in different voices, will interact, compete, and conspire, and so energize one another. Now, I'd like to say this was the early case, uh, this was the case in the early days of the tech revolution in Silicon Valley, which uh, outside of San Francisco, which I've written about, or in Nehru Place in Delhi. We found in Silicon Valley that you needed to have about 40 startups uh, to produce every patent, which is to say that the, that is an example of the art of technology uh, in the pre-monopoly days, resulting from lots of people interacting with each other in the arts, in the tech business. We need to think the same way in financing culture. We want to build communities if we want to build creative industries. That's a basic rule of this. God may be able to cherry pick uh, the Google platform, which is going to uh, raise, what is it, 80 billion? What are these, what are they up to? God may be understand what that is. But for us, the process of experiment, failure, and most of all, communication amongst people in a community, a living community of creative types, is what will produce uh, culture. Uh, and we can't know that in advance by trying to cherry pick the one that looks promising to lift the individual out of the mass. But this alone, this is my the last thing I'd like to say to you, cannot be the whole answer. When I chaired the Urban Studies Committee at UNESCO, we pondered how investment in our World Heritage Sites could serve local communities as well as uh, becoming tourist beacons. Our solution was partial in places which required restoration, uh, local artisans got the work, and the sites became places for educational programs on history and heritage. But that doesn't grapple with the issue of building new or building big. Instead of the Elbe Philharmonie model, how could a concert hall be designed for programs small as well as big? How could it be integrated into the everyday working lives of artists in the city? It's the same problem to be put to big museums. Their public consists of makers as well as visitors. And how can a museum service the needs of creators for community amongst ourselves? More following on the tech line, how can big cultural institutions become something like laboratories in which uh, there are some successes, many failures, in which for every one, the, every one of those patents required 39 uh, failures or ended or aborted projects. Creative work entails failure and it entails frustration. And that's not something that is easily, easily exposed outside of the community. So how should we support this? That is, invest in this necessarily dark side of the creative process. And so my argument to you is that we need in some way to orientate ourselves to make institutions large and small work. I hate the term creative industries, because it's not an industry but that creative work of all sorts, uh, artistic as well as technical, uh, flourishes because people are interacting face to face with each other. Now, these are all questions I've put to my friends Elizabeth Diller and Rick Scafidio, who have been engaged lifelong in designing experimental cultural spaces. Um, if the miracles of technology deliver, I think they I'm hoping. Liz and I are going to sh now share some of that discussion with you. 
uh, and it will continue in a later uh, session on infrastructure planning, which follows this plenary, uh, pushed further by members of Teatro Mundi, Assemble, and we made that. All young institutions run by people who, like Jonathan Mills' staff, never seem to sleep in pursuit of new ways to think about and make living cultural spaces. So with that introduction, we'll now show a film, hopefully, about uh, what Liz and Rick did in, uh, to make uh, such an alive communal space in New York City. So we began uh, to work on the High Line in about 2004, following an international competition. And it was the most unlikely project to imagine a park in the air on obsolete urban infrastructure in the Chelsea District of New York. We were part of a group, um, including these you know, very, very young, um, entrepreneurial thinking uh, citizen activists that wanted to preserve the High Line, and we came and proved how it could be done. We sold the project by basically telling the government that we imagined two, 300 to 400,000 people a year would visit it. So that was a real uh, uh, understatement. Now that we look back, last year there were more than seven and a half million people that were on the High Line. So the question is, well, why was it so popular? What happened? Um, and I think that we touched on something that was that we could not predict before. It was a convergence of the desire of the public in cities to, to leave work, to be able to have downtime, to leave their devices. The High Line um, makes a special place for people to be unproductive, a place to actually do nothing. The other thing that we touched on, which um, was um, a little bit unexpected, um, was by using this obsolete piece of infrastructure, um, we were responding to something much broader. We have limited resources on, on the earth. We're constantly thinking about adaptive reuse. But we haven't really thought so much about it, adaptive reuse of urban infrastructure. And after the High Line, many policymakers all over the globe started to imagine that um, various pieces of spent infrastructure, whether they be highways, bridges, uh, railroad infrastructure, could also be turned into linear parks. I truly believe that um, cultural spaces um, need to be rethought and reinvented. So for uh, a large part of the early career, we were lobbing grenades across the wall as artists or as performance artists, creative people working across disciplines, but always um, crit critiquing the institution. Um, at some point, we were asked to actually design the institution, imagine it, invent it. So we ended up having to build those very walls that we wanted to destroy before. Our society is changing so fast. Um, the way we work, the way we play, the way we communicate um, is, is so different than it was even 10 years ago that our institutions really need to keep up with that um, and to make room for artists uh, to be able to speak in new ways to new publics. It's not an extra, it's a necessity. Um, and one needs to think about it as an essential, just like infrastructure, just like cold and hot running water, just like fresh air. Um, one needs to think about the infusion of a culture in our everyday, in our educational system, in our new institutions. Um, and that's what makes society keep going. There you are. Well, one thing I think is very striking about the High Line is that you're now actually using it to produce um, a new kind of opera, that, it's, uh, that you're using it as a space for production rather than as a space of enjoyment for the public. 
that the opportunity of making a work of art there was something that stimulated, is stimulating you and many hundreds of other people uh, to use the space in ways that weren't predicted before. Can you say something about that? Yes. Um, so the, uh, the, the entire experience of, of making the High Line uh, from conception to, it's, it still continues to be constructed, uh, so from 2014 to now, um, it has seen huge, tremendous growth and transformation. Um, and it made us think very, very hard about uh, the role of the architect um, in, uh, in the course of the life decay cycle of a city. Um, so we came to the area of the High Line. It was full of um, empty parking lots. Uh, the land was totally devalued. Uh, the uh, property owners uh, pushed, pushed the mayor to, uh, to actually demolish the High Line. Um, and so when the High Line was preserved and became so successful, uh, it became maybe a little too successful uh, and produced an enormous amount of gentrification. And a lot of what we loved about it, the grittiness of the High Line, um, had totally transformed into glassy towers. Um, and it made us really think about um, what's the role of the architect post-occupancy? Um, how do we measure success? Uh, and one of the things we desperately wanted to do was to talk about this very issue in a, a creative work using the potential of the one and a half mile park um, as a stage, as a huge urban stage, um, to sort of tell the story in a new form. Um, and that's what we call the mile long opera. And maybe we could just get slide two uh, on there. Um, and so the, the uh, project um, is, a, is a huge choral work with 1,000 singers uh, made up of almost 40 choirs from all over New York, many avocational churches and uh, uh, schools uh, and community centers from all over New York. David Lang is the composer, and uh, Carson is one of the writers, and Claudia Rankin. And uh, we decided to sort of do this. Um, we decided to produce it. Uh, as well as direct it, um, as well as uh, as really do everything. So, um, and raise the money as well. Um, and the reason I'm not with you today is because we're in rehearsals uh, for uh, the premiere run, which will be in early October uh, on the High Line. So this is the first large scale use of the High Line for a tremendous cultural event that looks at the city almost um, as uh, it's is, is the backdrop and it's also the real time place uh, that we want people to contemplate. Well, I think that's more, I mean, it's an amazing project, but I think it's more, uh, more indicative of a, of a new way that many uh, artists are thinking about their relation to the city, which is that it's actually a source of material for making art, that it's a resource rather than um, uh, a place where already made work is done. And that leads to a different way of thinking about what a production is, what a creation is about. Uh, it's, uh, and Tatramundi is trying to do this in Paris. It's only three quarters of a mile long, but with the disused train station to use the sounds and voices of ordinary people in the city. But this uh, is, so we're, we're a junior version of you. But this, I think, more generally, is a kind of reorientation of the way about artists feel about the environment, which is it's not an environment. It's a place to, to be in and to use as an artistic resource. Makes sense? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I agree with that. I think that... Um, as, as our studio has um, sort of thought about and proven time and time again, is that, is that the, the only the place for art is not necessarily in the gallery uh, nor for music in the concert hall. It's, it's really um, everything and everywhere. And as uh, creative people are breaking the boundaries between disciplines and rethinking institutions, rethinking uh, their own disciplines, it's it's uh, it, it's it's very important to um, 
um, to, to basically look, look at everything as raw material. So for us, the very thing that we made, now we're looking at it as an artifact. And now it's a piece of the city. It's a piece of its iconicity now. It's, um, and, and it's transformed everything around it. And one has to be working in real time. Sometimes um, you step in this uh, uh, sort of cycle of change and you've created something that you don't even know, you never expected. And now it's something for you to react to. It's a kind of very, very interesting cycle that we never anticipated uh, uh, that we would be part of. Because normally we um, make structures, we build buildings, we walk away and they have their own life. Um, and one of the curious things about being an architect in one's own city is that now you are the beneficiary uh, uh, of whatever you've done. Um, and, and, and that sort of makes you think in a very, very different way of um, what is the future of that and, uh, of what, and, and, how, and what is its longevity? Um, which, which leads me to also maybe um, talking a little bit about the shed. Uh, and I, I, maybe we can point to um, slide uh, nine. Because something uh, very, very interesting uh, happened in this part of the city, uh, the very west side. And you could see there the green line is the, is the very northern uh, arm of the High Line that wraps around Hudson Yards, which is an active train yard. Um, and uh, some time ago, the city uh, and the state actually uh, decided to develop that property. It's the last huge tract of, of, of land to be developed in New York. And um, of course, the High Line uh, was a catalyst also to, to the land value there. Um, and we had the opportunity to, uh, to rethink what a new cultural institution might be, given the possibility of a very small tract of land on a new, a very new property. And uh, so the blue is the shed. It's a new cultural entity that was kind of our brainchild. Um, and then next to it is uh, that yellow tower uh, is, is a building that we also made uh, as a residential tower, which was for commercial uh, developer. So we did three different projects there uh, that just by chance, and, and maybe not by some, so much chance, but we were uh, uh, three very, very different clients. The, uh, the, uh, the shed is uh, uh, a non-for-profit totally independent, sovereign, non-for-profit. So these three elements somehow now coexist in some, some kind of ensemble um, that just happened. Uh, well, nothing just happens, but... <laughs> uh, do you imagine that, uh, in talking about scale, the shed is enormous, by the way. It's a, it's a huge structure. It's a retractable... I'm not going to explain your project, but it's basically a retractable structure that can become quite large. I'm interested in how you'll use that as a space for artists to experiment. This, this very flexible, uh, very large space. Uh, what kind of programming would suit what you're doing in building that building? Okay, uh, maybe um, we can just go to slides 10 through 27 and maybe play them. Um, so the shed, the idea of the shed really came out of uh, my frustration also in what has happened uh, to New York. And this is to your point, maybe Richard, um, that in the 70s, New York was a great place of production, artistic production. It was, it was a time uh, when I was in school, um, uh, People like Matt Clark and Phil Glass and, and Saul LeWitt, Patti Smith. There were so many people um, producing uh, so many different things. Uh, rent was cheap, and, um, and the city has changed tremendously since then. That was a time of production. Today is a time of consumption. And most artists have moved out um, and have been priced out of their, their lofts. So um, we thought, uh, wouldn't it be great to bring some of that production back to New York. And the shed sort of, we seized the moment uh, in an opportunistic way where the city said, um, we don't know what to do with this, 
with this piece of property. Um, does anyone have any ideas? This was in 2008, the economy was tanking. Um, and we thought that perhaps um, there could be something. Uh, uh, well, first of all, we said, what does art look like in five years, in 10 years, in 20 years? Um, and, and basically the response is, we don't know. We have no idea. And the best thing we could do uh, to preserve a place for culture and cultural production is to make uh, an architecture of infrastructure. And what I mean by that is uh, a little bit what Cedric Price meant uh, in, the, in the Fun Palace, um, where <clears throat> basically space is preserved, um, there's a lot of structure, um, loading capacity, a lot of power and uh, the ability to do pretty much anything you want, lots of space. You could make small space, large space. Um, and if we could uh, make a building that isn't just neutral, because we usually think of this kind of flexibility with, um, without architectural distinction, but what if we could make a building with distinction that also has this capacity for transformation, interpretation, and change that could be rescripted re uh, every day um, and on into the future, then, um, then we would be uh, bringing back something of what was lost. So, the shed, speed up to today, is uh, now going to open in 2019. Um, Alex Poots is the artistic director and CEO uh, from uh, Manchester Festival. And uh, he is, uh, the, the, he's doing a fantastic job and um, the shed will only commission new work and co-produce with cultural institutions all over the, the globe um, and also uh, inspire uh, and, and leave space for local artists uh, to do all sorts of things. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we all look, this is, this is a wonderful uh, project. Richard and Liz, can I just say thank you very much. That was utterly fascinating. Uh, thank you for that presentation, Liz, and for joining us from New York. I hope we get a chance to uh, see it for ourselves in the next new, new future. Uh, may I now ask our next guest, Sanjoy Roy, who is the Managing Director of Teamwork Arts in India, to present his thoughts in working in areas with limited infrastructure uh, and with a wide range of artists and audiences. Sanjoy. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. That presentation was just amazing, and I, I, you know, I just want to stand up and shout and scream and say every city should take an example of that and go out there and create policies to make it possible. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, presiding Officer Jonathan Mills, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, ministers, artists don't necessarily create work only to entertain. They create work because they have a volition to create work. They create work because they wish to represent the past, reflect on the future, and perhaps also put a mirror to what's happening and make sense of the present. For far too long has the arts sector continued to be seen as a handout, as a charity case. What you all forget, and maybe remind you again and again, as artists and people working in the arts, that the arts does produce tangible and intangible wealth in many different ways and across the globe. You may choose not to acknowledge it. You may choose to continue to cut the budgets of arts organizations and infrastructure projects, but you do so at some peril. I'm going to give you a few examples of some of the work that we've been partly responsible for, but really in a way been facilitators uh, to rather than us ourselves uh, doing it all. We work across the globe. We work, I think, in about 40 countries. We run 26 art festivals, everywhere from Australia uh, through to the United States and bits in between, places where there is distress, places where there's conflict, Israel and Egypt and Zimbabwe and South Africa and Alice Springs in Australia and so on and so forth. And in each of these places, we have found that every time we're able to bring an intervention of the arts and make an investment, it changes the lives of the people, it changes the lives of the community, and it brings about great economic progress. 
In 2002, the then Western Australia Minister of Interior had asked me, had invited me to come over. Primarily, I get invited to many of these things, including this, because I've got long hair, and Jonathan had cut his hair. Um, not so much because I know what I'm talking about, but 2002, Western Australia, the Interior Minister had, taken a, had come to see something that we were doing in India with street children. I set up a street children's organization 30 years ago. It started with about 25 kids. Today, we have 9,500 children. And much of the work that we do there to mainstream them is using the arts, music, theater, dance, literature, film, uh, and everything. Of course, everybody then wants to become an artist, and I'm going, whoa, hold on a minute. You can do other things as well. It's not necessarily only the arts you must be responsible for. The Western Australian government wanted to reimagine open prisons because, as you all know, uh, in Western Australia, 2% uh, of their population is aboriginal, 98% of their prison population is aboriginal. This one particular community that we were taken to outside of Kalgoorlie, 40, 40 miles outside of Kalgoorlie, had a 100% incarceration rate. That means from cradle to grave, everybody had been to prison. So all we said is that, why don't we work uh, together collectively with these communities in a 100 kilometer radius and allow them to create a project uh, which would define their language, their form, their art, and tell their stories. It was a big desert project. And in doing so, the only thing that we asked the government to do is we said, don't ask uh, the communities to come into your town to receive their dole. But can your dole officer go out to the community uh, in a van to be able to make the payments? And can you also send a truck or a van with supplies and provisions for this period of time? And can you map it over a six month period? Needless to say, most of you will know in any community that you get dole, you get the money at the one end of the street, you then go to the alcohol shop, and then you know, at the end of the street, there's a policeman who's finally sort of arresting you and throwing you into jail. This is you know, for most disenfranchised and uh, communities where there is inequity. What happened was that they realized that the incarceration rate went from 100% to 12.5% in that six month period. This is not rocket science, and this is something that governments need to understand. Similarly, um, in, uh, in South Africa, in uh, I think just maybe it was 2005, 2006, I can't remember, Stephen Sachs, who was the head of culture uh, in Newtown in the Hautang district of Johannesburg, approached our high commission to ask whether I would come out and give them a little bit of advice in terms of how to resurrect Newtown, which had fallen apart, all the wealth had disappeared, it was crime infested, there was only Standard Bank and SNB. When we came in there to assess what the need was, we said to uh, the city government, we said, if you are able to delineate an arts precinct in Newtown and ensure that there is great lighting and excellent policing 24 seven, I said, I promise that in three years, I would walk across Mary Fitzgerald Square with my phone and my, uh, with my mobile phone and I wouldn't be mugged. It came to pass. Restaurants opened up, art galleries, photography shops, the, uh, the old um, power center was transformed into a conference center, the museums came up, uh, Baseline with Brad did an incredible job, pizzerias opened up, and today more and more investment has come into that particular area. Again, this is not rocket science, this is something that all of you should be doing in communities where you find that there's a problem and you need to find some kind of way to be able to create uh, a new beginning. In Egypt, just after the, um, the Arab Spring, uh, we got a call again by our Hack Commission, they had been approached by that government of the time, and again we went out there and we understood that 80% of their GDP was based on tourism and it had disappeared uh, over that period of time and now people needed to live and they needed jobs and they needed the tourism to come back. And again, what we did is we said, well, we need to show the world that Egypt is safe. So all we did is we began a festival there, but we began it at the airport, at Terminal 1 off, uh, uh, in, in Cairo. And what that did was it beamed out images by BBC and CNN and so on and so forth across the world and allowed people to at least understand that 
people who are not Egyptian were coming back into the country and it was a safe environment. Uh, Logan International Airport in Boston roughly at the same time because of the bombings in Boston connected with us to say, could we do the same thing in Boston? I immediately said no. I said Homeland Security would never allow it. They'd arrest every artist plus you'll never give us visas, so there's no point even considering this particular artistic intervention in America. The reason I give you these examples is to show that you don't need a lot of money. You don't need uh, a lot of um, uh, new ideas or thoughts. You can look at what is existing, as we saw a little while ago, and transform your space and transform it for good. My own experience uh, in creating this platform was actually thanks to the city of Edinburgh, which I visited thanks to the British Council in 1999 as part of one of their, their missions to take people out to show them Edinburgh. And I was so transformed by the collective energies of these thousands of artists from across the globe coming together. Yes, a lot of the work that you see is um, it's perhaps rubbish or not so good. But when you see that collective energy and when you see a moment of brilliance as we did yesterday, for those of you who came to see home, it lifts your heart, it lifts your soul, and it transforms you. And it transformed me and it gave me a sense of we need to create these many platforms, we need to believe again in the arts. Unfortunately, the very same city of Edinburgh today, because of your policies, presiding officer of the present government, I suspect, you don't allow visas to many communities, many people who would like to come here and participate in this incredible offering of culture. We need to break down our boundaries. On one hand, you're talking about the internet having democratized us and having been allowing us all to come together across the world. At the same time, every country, every city state across the world feels threatened, threatened by artists, feels that we don't speak their language necessarily, feels that we wish to jump their visas and stay on in other countries, and they deny us that right to speak, to be able to express ourselves. For all of us together in this very complicated and complex world that we inhabit, the one thing that can bring about a difference, especially in societies where there is inequity, all the way from America through to India and Indonesia and Africa and everywhere else is knowledge and education. And the arts provides that. It gives you an opportunity, it opens your mind, it creates a window to be allowed to be, to be able to see a different history, a different culture, a different philosophy, a different way of being able to work. And that's the investment we need to do. That's what we have to create. I'm going to share three small short stories with you just again to see how investment in the arts in people makes a difference. At Salam Balak Trust, the street children project that uh, we, we began, uh, there was a young boy who, you know, he wasn't great in, in, in his studies, so his teacher said to him, why don't you find something to do, you know, not necessarily education after your 10th standard, and he said, oh, I want to do photography because one of his uh, peers had be become very successful in that. Vicky Roy, uh, we sort of put him through a photography course. He was part of a whole process of training. Uh, he, he, we seconded him to two or three uh, photographers uh, of some uh, eminence. And then he went on to find his own voice. Today, Vicky speaks across the world in every TED Talk conference that you have. His work sits in most private collections across museums across the world, and this was a child who was from the street unlettered. Similarly, uh, in, in, in another case, uh, at the Jaipur Literature Festival, which is a festival that we started 11 years ago, and we started it with 250 people who came uh, through our doors in the first year. This year, 11 years later, we had half a million people come through our doors over five days. 61% uh, of that half a million are below the age of 25. Four years into the setup of the festival, because we were very clear that we wanted to aim at young people, make it a city festival, wanted to reach out to all of those people who didn't have access to this kind of education and learning. We had put into place security, 
And because I sort of stand there to receive people uh, for, one, for an hour every day when we open the doors at 7.30 a.m., I was standing there and this man and boy walked off the street and they were stopped because they looked like they didn't belong. And because I was there, I went up and I said, can I help you? And the man said, you know, I sleep on the pavement up the road opposite the SMS hospital. And I know I'll never be able to afford to send my son to school, nor be able to afford to buy him a book. But I thought that if he heard a story, it would change his life forever. And I'm sorry that I have come. I didn't realize that this was not for me. And I said, not only is it for you, I want hundreds and thousands more people like you to come in. This is a shared space. And you have to understand the sociological uh, 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 context of this, that in a city like Jaipur, which lives in many centuries at the same time, walking through the, the, the gate of a palace like that is unthinkable on a regular day. And yet he believed he could come. That brought about change. And this change we know, ladies and gentlemen, is something that we can feel, something that's important, something that can break down boundaries and barriers, something that can bring us together. It is war out there. There is hatred. The genie of hatred once released, you cannot put it back into the bottle. How can we bring about change? The arts is one possible way of, of doing that. What we need from you is action, not lip service. What we need from you is investment, not charity. What we need from you is intent and support. Intent and support to support artists and allow them their voice, irrespective of color, race, country, or religion. Each of you who have come here from your countries, be it senior bureaucrats or ministers, please, we are not your threat. We are here to work with you. We are here to create more understanding. We are here to, be, to want to be, our voices to be heard across communities and across places of inequity and divide. Please don't look at us as a threat. Don't shut us down. Please support these individual voices from Bangladesh all the way to the Philippines and everywhere in between. We need your help. We must stand together. We owe it to our next generation. Our time is long over. Invest in young people, invest in the arts, invest in the future of communities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sanjoy. Can I now invite Konstantin Kiriak, President of the Sibiu International Theatre Festival in Romania, to speak. Mr. Kiriak. Kiriak. Let me sell you my dreams. Take these dreams for whatever you want to pay me. I want money. I need money in order to buy the time to get the things that money will not buy. I'm so happy to be together with all of you and to discuss together about what means culture and investments. If we are thinking that all of us are human beings and we receive the biggest gift, our life, and we didn't pay something for it, it's so important receiving something to give back. So, being here in Edinburgh, one of the best examples in the world, what means a community 
developed in a coherent way. Where the artists, together with producers, together with institutions, together with politicians, having a long vision after the Second World War, developed something unique in the world to develop the beauty. I was born in Romania in a communist country and I got my education at that period. Since in 89 I haven't any possibilities to leave Romania and to travel. No passport, nothing. In 89, was something unbelievable. I don't know if it was revolution or... But, you know, the people went in the street. And exactly after this shoot of Ceausescu, I started to travel. I traveled since now in 152 different countries. And when I'm saying 152, here in Edinburgh, I have been already 50 times. And I was an actor in the period of, of Ceausescu, in Sibiu, middle of Transylvania, a city with a community definitely very special, Romanians, Germans, Hungarians, Gypsies, Jewish, and so on. And I want to put a point on community, what Richard mentioned in the beginning. It's so important that all of us are belonging to a community. And when we are saying community, it means human beings. In 92, I got the first possibility to be in a culture capital of Europe in Antwerp. And at that time started the war in ex-Yugoslavia. Sarajevo was surrounded by the Serbs. And Ibrahim Spasic, the director of uh, Winter Festival, called Eric Antonis saying, my dear, here the hell came. All the people are here on the bulls in front of guns and so on. Help us. And all the artists decided to push the Parliament of Europe to do association to help them to do something. And at that time, the Parliament of Europe decided Sarajevo to be alternative culture capital of Europe. Being there, as an artist, by chance I know to say three weeks poetry. It's a way, you know, to be healthy. I put in my mind and I said, I'll do for my city this. Because of that, I started with the idea to do something that money could not buy. To, be some, to do something unique for your people. In Romania, there is a fabulous space, Delta of Danube. And we have many, many debates why we are not attracting, you know, tourists, why you are not protecting this and so on. We have less than half a million tourists in this unbelievable space in the world. It's the third biggest delta in the world. I know what is the way. If we'll be a research about all the people living in Delta of Danube, and this is extending for all your communities, about the people who are living in the community, what are their celebration in the religious dimension? What are their celebrations in what means the jobs of them? So the like celebration. What are the celebration belonging to the nature? And if you are doing an agenda of this and improving with culture together with the artist, you can have what Sibiu has now. I started the festival in 93. 
with only three countries and eight shows. This was exactly in the 27th of March, when is the International Day of Theatre. And definitely was something unbelievable for the city. After that, you know, having so many friends, all of them, they said, hello, Constantine, you have a fantastic city. You might use these historical spaces. You have so many churches. Move the festival, and I move it. I did it in the end of May, beginning of June. Until in 2007, when I developed the new festival, I was growing, you know, step by step to do also the idea of each festival to bring together the new, uh, you know, writers, you know what means, dramaturgy. And in uh, 97, I dis uh, decided to do the culture market. And in the same time, I understood how important it is to bring the young generation together with us. So I developed also a theater school and also the culture market. In 2000, I took the theater from the city as the general director, and in four years, I changed this theater in National Theater of Sibiu. Now, after 18 years, I have in my repertory 121 different shows. We are playing around 400 representations per year with all the tickets sold for all the shows. In 2007, I developed the culture capital of Europe, Sibiu. It was something unbelievable, because I was in front of the jury, and the jury said, you can't receive this title, because look, this was in 2004. There are 10 countries coming in the Europe now, and they don't have permission to have culture capital till in 2009. And I said, please show me the decision of the parliament. They, and they did it. And there was mentioned 10 countries, not Romania. Definitely Romania was not prepared for that. But I said, in the law, we have the right, because Romania is not mentioned. And there was a big scandal, they said, stop, and after the discussion with the, the assistants of them, they said he has the right. Unfortunately, Romania was not mentioned there, so they have the right. But you might show us that you have an independent structure to lead this. So I did the foundation, Democracy Through Culture Foundation, that is leading the festival. Because of the culture capital, we developed a culture agenda of the city. And now, Sibiu has the biggest budget in culture in the world. I'm not joking. 12% of the entire budget of the city. But what it is really fantastic, we are bringing back to the city 16% because of this culture agenda. What we develop also, it's so important, all of you from Europe know that you know Creative Europe. The, the, the meaning for the program now is building the new audience. So we did this for all the actions that we decided to do. For all the shows in the festival. And this year, for the 25th anniversary, we got 3,300 artists coming from 73 different countries. We played in 73 different venues with around 70,000 spectators per day. So the idea was to bring the beauty, the miracle, the quality near to the public that are not coming for the indoor shows. And this was the way to build the new audience. 
I know what I'm saying, it's not very nice. In the Western countries and in America, all the people are fighting for dance and education, music and education, theater and education, and so on. And unfortunately, the spectators are less and less and more older. The only problem that we have is to stop the public. We don't have, we don't have enough seats. We are working in culture factories, and I did things like that, and I did one of the biggest shows in Europe, Faust, and I got the pleasure to work with Jonathan Mills to bring this fabulous show here in Edinburgh. We got 75 reviews with five stars. All the tickets are sold with two months ago. Yeah. yeah. So, coming back, it's so important for all of you to understand how important it is to work with the community. This year, Romania is celebrating 100 years anniversary. And I ask the Ministry of Culture of Romania that is here. We are doing the celebration of Romania. We pay attention for heritage and history and so on, but it's important to do the celebration with our partners. So His Excellency accepted to give a good help and to have this money to do the celebration together with all our partners. Thank you for what we are doing in your communities and for your artists. Thank you very much, Mr. Kiriak. And our final presentation in this part of the plenary is Dr. Maria Balshaw, CBE, Director of the Tate Art Museums. Dr. Maria Balshaw. Thank you very much. And um, what all of they, they said, because as last speaker, I will inevitably be covering um, some important shared ground. Um, I wanted to start with a story about Tate. And Tate began its life as a fledgling National Museum of British Art, built on the site of London's most notorious prison in Millbank. It was, therefore, an early bit of cultural development work, created along with its peer institutions in Exhibition Road and the National Gallery, which helped create Trafalgar Square, as part of the shaping of a capital city in, in the UK. In our own time, Tate's first foray outside London was to here, um, part of an explicit agenda in Liverpool, fostered by politician Michael Heseltine, amongst others, to jumpstart Liverpool out of post-industrial decline after riots in Toxteth. This was the first Tate that I got to know. I arrived as a student just as Tate opened, and my parents took me for my leaving home meal down at the docks, newly created um, as a cultural destination rather than a, work, rather than a working docks. And I encountered Dali's lobster telephone at Tate Liverpool. I was hooked. You could say it's why I ended up in the job I'm now in. If we fast forward 12 years, um, I had been walking along um, the South Bank for many years, a site of desolation until this arrived as part of the conversion of a power station in, on the Thames in a previously rather deserted part of Southwark, which became a gallery of modern international art, which everyone said couldn't work. Um, so it's signaled by the arrival of spiders inside the building and also outside on the edge of the Thames, Louise Bourgeois, Bourge, Bourgeois as many of you will know. It was a project rather like the High Line that was predicted to attract 1.25 million people to this newly created gallery space and saw 5.25 million visitors in its first year. So more latterly, it grew again to become this. And in its first year of operation, saw 8.4 million visits. Tate's expansion changed London fundamentally. It made it a global centre for contemporary art in a way that it had never been before. And it made contemporary art part of the mainstream life of a world city. 
with the many other businesses, cultural and community partners, it also regenerated its neighbourhood and still strives to make this a living, working neighbourhood and not simply, as Richard described, about the displacement of existing resident communities and artists to make way for the wealthy and the culturally connected. And to do that sensitively is very hard work. There's a bit more of um, a life story here, though, before I move back to Tate. Another 16 years after the opening of Tate Modern, I moved to Manchester to take on the much-loved but then rather dusty Whitworth Art Gallery. Manchester was then in the midst of what I would call the second phase of its cultural regeneration, having rebuilt cultural infrastructure out of the industrial desolation of the 1970s decline of industry and the devastation of an IRA bomb in the city centre. I was appointed to carve out a new future for a wonderful art collection and a slightly decrepit building that had lost its connection to people. So this building, not a very attractive face to its local park, became this, expanded and regenerated. But what really happened was that the Whitworth reconnected to the park and the culture and the communities and life around it and became a thriving space for art, like Cornelia Parker's, but also for people making things, speaking absolutely to that point about spaces for production at the heart of our cultural regeneration. In doing so, and through giving young people and local communities a space to shape their own ideas and events using those wonderful collections, the Whitworth One Museum of the Year. For very similar reasons, by which I mean enlightened capital expansion combined with long-running, ground-up building of community and culture in the Raymond Williams sense of culture rather than the sense of culture as the high arts, I'm proud to say that Tate St Ives another Tate outpost, is currently UK's Museum of the Year. These are, of course, or have at their heart, capital projects at the centre of them. But I would say, following the thread of all my fellow speakers, I'd suggest that capital regeneration on its own isn't the whole answer, and that sometimes, within the cultural sector, we've been a bit beguiled with the bricks and the mortar and the concrete. I certainly loved working on the Whitworth project with gifted architects, Muma, two of whom are Scottish um, and trained um, up here, um, and working with artists who were very engaged with the project from the earliest stages. And God knows, as director of Tate, I have inherited some extraordinary buildings to work within. But Tate's various expansions were always about working with and building communities as well as creating buildings. And in this lies the reason, in my view, why cities can't afford not to invest in culture in all its diversity of forms. So this too was the case, I think, in what I called the second phase of Manchester's cultural renaissance, still ongoing, which is all about engaging people and taking some risks together, including across arts organisations, city councils, arts funders and private business interests, rather as we heard with the High Line. On the back, so in Manchester, on the back of hosting a Commonwealth Games and finding that the mass volunteering and the cultural programme had helped make it an unbelievable success, Manchester set up a festival whose unique selling point was to take risks, a festival of firsts, um, in a city that was the first industrial modern city. Alex Poots, now director at The Shed, set up that festival. You'll hear some commonalities between what I talk about in Manchester and what's going on in The Shed. And those of us who were working alongside Alex at that time in the city reveled in this permission because it gave us the opportunity to not be like London, to not compete necessarily with the world cities, to take some different kinds of risks and do difficult things that might take people with us. Um, and through this, and I think through a more sophisticated understanding that has evolved in recent years of the intrinsic benefits of sharing more widely the tools and the opportunities that support creativity and expressiveness, um, the City Council has come to a view that it is necessary to invest in culture for all the social as well as the economic reasons. 
It's exemplified for me by an amazing project I was lucky enough to work on, caught here in this image. Developed at the Whitworth with Alex at the festival and the artist Marina Abramovich, which persuaded highly sceptical northerners to become part of a live art experiment long before Marina held court at MoMA in New York. We agreed, Alex and I, that we would empty the Whitworth of all its, all its collections so that Marina could place within it 14 live artists and invite audiences to come for four hours at a time, put on a lab coat and become part of a live art experiment. Alex and I were happy to do it because we thought it was a niche project that would bring us a lot of critical credibility. We were surprised when it was an 18-day sellout because people liked the invitation to take a risk together. This risk-taking approach in Manchester rode on the co coattails of a government-led debate about the Northern Powerhouse. George Osborne even had a banner. Um, and the debate about investing in the north of England as opposed to in the capital city alone um, um, galvanised both cultural thinking and, eventually, financial investment. It irritated some people. There was a whole question around why Manchester, haven't they got enough already? And is it all going to be about buildings again? But the cultural dimensions of this northern cultural activity didn't start with a building. It started with a vision toward being a more culturally democratic region with people engaged in enjoying, creating and appreciating a wider body of cultural practices. And it was part of the active construction of civic identity. So the argument was made in Manchester, but also at Tate Liverpool, in Sheffield, in Newcastle, that there was social, cultural, economic and political benefit from this kind of engagement. And I think Scotland led the way with a lot of this thinking, starting with Glasgow. It was exemplified for me when Alex's successor at the festival, John McGrath, um, made his first piece of work for his first festival in 2017 with Jeremy Della, was titled, What is a City but its People? It was a 60 metre catwalk show across Piccadilly Gardens, um, engaging the range of communities that reflected Manchester in that year. So its creative practice was about participation. It was a joyous occasion to be part of. Not least because completely anonymously, my daughter had been selected as the um, paradigmatic teenager, which was a surprise to me. So the, the vision for the festival, and now a vision for a building called the Factory, in honour of Manchester's factory records and that period of creative energy in the city, um, is being created as a new building, rather as Liz Diller described, um, uh, a space for artists to make the art of the future in tandem with people. And the shed and the factory's thinking has um, bounced off each other rather beautifully. I feel we are all at the beginning of a new chapter. The questions that face us now are not so much about how we continue to expand our infrastructure, but rather how we connect to an expanded and more diverse audience in our towns and cities, as well as with audiences globally. We also need to think about how we meet the future needs of artists and protect their creativity within our cities, just as Richard was describing. And, as all of the panellists have talked, we need to be defending the value of art to society. And I do think it needs defending. And we need to defend where it gets made. A question we have opened up and explored within the new Tate building itself, within Tate Exchange. And this was part of a project that invited our audiences to debate where culture gets made. There is so much that's positive about our current cultural moment, even as we wrestle with greater social and political polarisation. We've seen the emergence of a politicised popular discourse about what the arts should be. Last year, we saw, I'm just going to fast forward through a few slides, swings in the Tate Modern, um, coordinated by the Danish collective Superflex. They are as politically engaged as they are fun to work with. 
and the swings that were inside the turbine hall saw people as the generators of the creative energy that is now driving a power station that's for culture. And it seems to me, in the context of Brexit debates, with, for us in London, the shadow of Grenfell Towers, um, reminding us of the consequences of the social and economic polarisation we see in our country and our cities, the cultivation of such joy in action as this project was, is not silly or playful, um, as some grumpy art critics suggested, but it is politically necessary and, um, and invites citizens into the making of the culture that they then enjoy. To me, the reasons for investment in culture are really clear. The problems that we all face across the globe, you will all recognise. It's about intolerance between people, inequalities across society, the social isolation of individuals, worse if you're poor, exacerbated if you're elderly. I don't think that museums or cultural institutions save lives, um, and I think we should resist that kind of missionary zeal. But I do think they contribute to the living of a good and engaged life. They make us more mentally resilient, give us a cheerier outlook on life which is not an insignificant thing. And that is part of the intrinsic value of culture for all people who are welcomed into our museums or invited to participate and create the art that surrounds us. In thinking in this way then, cultural institutions aren't just about their infrastructure, but they can be partners in the complex shaping of places where a wide diversity of people can live and thrive and work. And this gives us the real case for investment in the culture of a city or a country. To quote Sir Richard Lees in Manchester, who I worked for for a long time as leader of Manchester City Councils, he said, tell me, really, who wishes to live in a city without culture? Thank you very much. Dr. Balsher, thank you very much indeed. And we're now going to move on to the first of our uh, ministerial responses. Uh, and I'll shortly invite our colleagues from Ghana uh, to contribute. Before I do, uh, I was speaking to uh, our Ghanaian uh, representatives last night. And I'm conscious that uh, one of the country's uh, leading sons, uh, Kofi Annan, the first black African to lead the United Nations, died just last week. And uh, our Ghanaian representatives have asked me if I would uh, perhaps lead the chamber in just a short moment of silence uh, to pay respects to Kofi Annan. So if you could join me just for a few moments to pay silence. And can I now call the Honourable Alex Kofi Agekum, Chairman of the Parliamentary Select Committee on Culture from Ghana. Uh, Mr. Kim, I think you can speak from your microphone at the desk. Probably best to stand, but the microphone okay. will come on live. There we are. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I'm very happy to uh, be part of this uh, conference, and I stand in on behalf of the Minister for uh, Tourism, Arts, and Creative Arts. I also thank you for the observance of, of a minute silence for uh, Mr. Kofi Annan, the former UN Secretary General. Your Excellencies, 
in response to whatever we've heard this afternoon, I would first of all like us to avert our minds to some critical and specific issues as I listened to previous speakers. There is no doubt that all of us are experiencing some recent revolutions. And to me, these revolutions have a reflection on our culture and the way we connect people and places. We are living in a world now where there is technological revolution with its impact on automation and cybernation, weapon revolution, which is also threatening in a form of terrorism and others. The human rights revolution, as we heard yesterday, which is gradually making people conscious of their human rights. We are aware of the fact that the world has become global village. But what is global village in a form of shortened distances if the complementary factors that will help us to enjoy the global village is not looked at? It took me close to almost seven and a half hours to be here from Ghana, Accra. That is how short the world has become. But apart from the distance that through technological advancements we've been able to achieve, what are the other intervening factors? And these factors I'm talking about, the one that binds us together, the brotherhoodness, the receptiveness. One of the speakers just mentioned the fact that we cannot oscillate between action and inaction. One way we are acting togetherness, bridging gaps, but we advance policies that will help us to achieve that. We need to look at it. Unfortunately, we don't want to speak about it, but the African still has the burden of racism. And of course, my brothers in Europe and in the Americas also have the shame of racism. We need to bridge that gap and eradicate it totally if we are supposed to make advancement in whatever we want to achieve. What is the way forward? The way forward from my country, first of all, is that we need to locate where we are to be able to know our destination. Where are we now? As individual countries, I believe that if we all critically look at our SWOT analysis, what is supposed to be our strength, our weaknesses, opportunities, and the threats, we can identify this. But there are some factors that are common to all of us. Investing in artists is investing in the individual and unearthing his or her talent. And to us, that is through education and training, apprenticeship. My brother from India just mentioned the fact that everything that we see in the world begins the artist. But critically, let us look at it. Yesterday I was talking about the Hague Convention. 64, 61 years ago, we all, a lot of our 131 countries so far have appended their signature to it. 61 years ago, where were some of the young artists that we had? 
61 years ago. So it means that even though the artists at the time didn't have any political ambition, they were trying to portray the issues at the time. Now, because of changing the revolutions, changes of the way we think and perception, the current generation may not have or understand the context within those artworks. And that's why I'm calling for education and retraining of the younger generation so that whatever is happening in the other non-Commonwealth countries can be averted. People are pulling down monuments and artifacts, artwork, because to them, they don't understand the positive aspect of what those monuments were built. Some of them negatively interpret it and see it as a symbol of oppression, a symbol of racism, and symbol of subjugation. And therefore, it's important and critical that if you are supposed to preserve this way, especially in non-commonwealth countries, then all of us here, it behoves on us to bring pressure to be up upon those countries to ensure that they adhere to the convention. We in Ghana, we have intro introduced culture into our educational system as was done by our first president. And already our universities are offering degree courses in arts and culture. The government is supporting that with funds into these institutions. And some artists like musicians are being given revolving fund as starter capital as we came, we came along with a young artist who, who is sitting just at my right hand side here, who has already won 20 awards. And just last year, he won the best songwriter of the year. <laughs> Investment in community, yes, it is essential that we invest in communities. But it is also equally important that we allow the communities to own those investments. If we isolate them and let them feel that the people who are supposed to benefit from the investment are themselves object of tourism, then we're going to have a problem. Recently, in my country, there was a particular time, a very nice cultural and tourist site. But whether improper education or handling, they went there and they were just going to look at the thing, taking pictures of the community without even going to shake hands with the people that their tradition requires. The chief of the place asked them not to come there again. So I'm saying that, yes, we invest in community, but let the people there enjoy. Train the local people there to take advantage and then come and manage those investments themselves. In that way, the people see that whatever investment that they are making, they can see it in cash and in kind. President Officer, I thank you. I believe that it's an opportune time and those things that we have come to hear and learn, it will help us to be able to uh, go forward. We have few challenges, but the challenges we have all enumerated. And there is no gain saying going to repeat those challenges. We believe that together we are all wearing a garment that is of the same destiny, and together we float or we sing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Agekum. And we're now going to hear from our friends from Brazil. And I'd like to call the Minister for Culture, Sergio Salitium. Ah, oh, there we are. 
Uh, if you don't mind, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to talk uh, seated, uh, because it will be not a speech, it's more uh, some comments and that I would like to share with you. So it's an honor to be here, and I'd like to congratulate the uh, Scottish Parliament for uh, organizing this uh, event. And it was great to hear from so many uh, different uh, people and, and experiences. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to uh, talk uh, about the uh, experience that we have we are having nowadays in Brazil uh, regarding uh, the uh, financing of culture, uh, both uh, in terms of uh, private uh, investment and also public investment as well. Uh, Brazil is uh, <clears throat> one of the countries that some uh, people call uh, underdeveloped countries. countries. We have uh, the uh, hard uh, task, the hard, hard uh, challenge in Brazil to uh, feed uh, 200 million people, to have jobs available for 200 uh, million people, to improve the quality of life of 200 uh, million people, to uh, build a more uh, tolerant and inclusive uh, social environment for uh, 200, 200 million people. And of course, to stimulate 200 million people to uh, transcend, to uh, live by more than their necessities, to fulfill uh, their uh, destinies as uh, human, being, human beings. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, and for that, uh, we have uh, a very uh, special and important tool, which is culture, our cultural values, our cultural uh, assets, our, our cultural diversity, and our cultural uh, ex expressions. So what we are trying to do right now uh, in, 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 in Brazil is uh, to, to really establish uh, cultural uh, as a tool to promote development and to promote uh, inclusion. And I really think that we are achieving a lot in uh, the way that we are facing this uh, challenge. And I do think that it's uh, not uh, what we are doing, it's not so different than uh, in, in many uh, underdeveloped countries as well to use this uh, common uh, expressions. Um, <clears throat> But what is incredible is that uh, most people uh, don't realize that the power of cultural to transform lives, the power of cultural to uh, promote uh, inclusive development uh, in, in countries uh, like Brazil. And if people don't realize, uh, less governments realize. Uh, so uh, the first challenge that we have uh, <clears throat> in terms of uh, establish uh, cultural policies devoted to promote cultural as a development tool is to make people realize its uh, power and how cultural can really uh, uh, increase and boost uh, the development uh, process. It's, it's uh, amazing, uh, I know, or, or hard to believe, sorry, uh, I know, but uh, only last year we started in, in, in Brazil to measure the impact of uh, cultural and cultural investment in the development or of our country. And uh, the results are, of course, amazing. And people are start realizing uh, its, uh, its power. Uh, for instance, I will share with you a very, very uh, small example. Um, <clears throat> we have in, in, in Brazil, a uh, literary event called uh, FLIP, the International uh, Literary uh, Party of uh, Parachi. Parachi is a pretty small uh, city with uh, 36,000 uh, inhabitants, a colonial city uh, which was uh, founded in uh, the 16th century uh, by the Portuguese. 
and uh, it's, a, it's a jewel of uh, cultural heritage. And this festival has been done in, in, in party for uh, 16 years. And this year we uh, conducted uh, uh, a very profound uh, economic impact study about how this event impacts uh, the city, its economy, and the lives of uh, uh, parties' uh, citizens. And uh, it's, uh, it was amazing to discover that uh, uh, the event costs less than $1 million. So it's pretty cheap in terms of, uh, it's, it's nothing, it's almost nothing uh, uh, in international uh, patterns. But it generated an impact of $10 million in the city uh, alone, generating 2,000 uh, uh, jobs. So it had an impact, actually, the, uh, with uh, a, a multiplier factor of uh, 10 per $1 uh, dollar invested, $10 in terms of uh, economic uh, in, in impact. And uh, it was amazing also to realize that uh, uh, the uh, public investment in this event was uh, something like uh, seven uh, hundred thousand uh, <coughs> dollars, and uh, uh, we had uh, a tax revenue for the city, the state government, and the uh, federal government of almost the double of that. So uh, it's. Uh, typically a uh, win-win-win situation, a triple win situation, because you have the social and the cultural impact of such an event in the lives of uh, more than 40,000 for, for, uh, 40, people, uh, uh, the people who participate in the event, which is more than the population of uh, 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 the city. You have the economic impact in terms of the generation of jobs and, and, and wealth and inclusion, and you have also uh, 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 a, tech, a tax revenue uh, success for the government. So. Uh, uh, an investment in, in, in cultural pays off to the state, not only because the social uh, impact, the social good that it makes, but also in terms of how much money the state earn by uh, tax revenue. So the investment in cultural generates money for other areas, for uh, healthcare, for education, and so on. And now we're having many, many, many uh, examples uh, like like that one uh, of Parachi of uh, uh, Flippy, and uh, I think uh, it uh, highlights the importance of cultural, uh, especially in a country as Brazil or Ghana or uh, many others, in terms of uh, facing in a practical way, so it's not theoretically, we're talking about a practical result of facing the challenges that I mentioned when I start talking to feed 200 million people and, and, and so on. Nowadays, the creative economy represents 2.64% of, uh, percent of uh, the Brazilian GDP. It employs uh, more uh, than uh, 1 million people we have more than 200,000 uh, companies and associations and, and, and groups uh, in this uh, sector. And from 2012 to 2016, uh, what we can call our creative economy uh, had an annual uh, 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 average growth rate of 9.1%, uh, uh, which is uh, more uh, than four times the average growth rate of uh, our uh, economy. So those numbers uh, <coughs> point out the uh, full potential that we have. So that's uh, because of that, that our government is investing uh, this year in, in many different areas, many different kinds of uh, projects in uh, festivals, in uh, training and education, in uh, many other areas, uh, $1 billion 
in, in uh, <clears throat> trying to boost the development of our uh, creative uh, economy, seeing cultural as a development promotion asset. And I think uh, other governments in other countries should do the same because uh, it's a way to face uh, the challenge of creating a better society for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Saleto. And can I now call much heralded uh, contribution from Lithuania. Uh, you're ready now. That's the <laughs> Sorry for calling you earlier. Um, I'd like to uh, ask the Minister for Culture for the Republic of Lithuania, Liana Rokit Jonsson. Oh, thank you. Uh, well, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank you for, for the kind invitation. I'm first time in, the, in Edinburgh, and I'm so uh, pleased to be here and to share some thoughts, some ideas uh, with my colleagues. And uh, it, it, it won't be a speech. It's uh, more about uh, commenting, maybe, uh, or talking about uh, what means uh, for us, uh, culture and investment. I think it's something here. Do you hear me now? Or yeah, good. Well, uh, as we know, probably uh, in Lithuania, uh, the new government started work in 2016 December, and um, well, uh, this government is very special one uh, because it's first time in the modern history that we have a professional government, so called uh, 14 ministers, and uh, 11 of uh, 14 are not anyhow party connected. Th they are professionals from uh, different uh, sectors. And we are going through uh, really big changes within the financial sector, healthcare, uh, social care, uh, education and science, and then of course uh, cultural policy. And everything is connected to the people, of course. Uh, well, um, we're here, um, uh, in this uh, mm, government to um, redesign the whole uh, cultural policy because it's time uh, to rethink uh, and to adopt more to um, uh, the processes uh, going on in the global world and also nevertheless in Europe. Uh, after 28 years of uh, restored independence of Lithuania, so lots of uh, structures became a bit old-fashioned, uh, too much bureaucratic, and not so very efficient, and therefore we have plans to change uh, many uh, sectors in many layers. And what we um, did already, or we're we going to do, uh, this is not only uh, changing the financial um, funding system uh, for, for culture and arts, but also um, initiating um, various instruments and programs uh, focused on uh, developing a new generation of culture users, um, pretty much uh, focusing on cultural edu education. Uh, also, uh, access to culture and um, involvement in, into creative process is uh, one of the top priorities, as well as uh, cultural uh, heritage preservation. Uh, well, we have plans to change uh, totally the whole system, and we are working on it. Uh, the model should be um, finished uh, in the end of the year. So uh, while working uh, with the uh, cultural policy, so we are, um, well, co-working with other sectors, uh, especially when it comes to regions. Regions uh, are for us um, a horizontal priority. And uh, so to say, together with the other ministries like internal affairs, social affairs, uh, healthcare or education and science and transportation, communication. So we are uh, creating a regional map uh, where we can identify uh, various uh, active centers and uh, of course, uh, we look through uh, all infrastructure as well, and uh, well, powers of creativity, and uh, implementing uh, from our own perspective, from our own sector, implementing various instruments and programs uh, to develop um, strong communities. Because I mean, strong culture can be when we develop strong community, when we um, encourage people to stay in their places where they live, 
to be uh, proud of their uh, identity, of their uh, local culture, uh, and uh, to be more, uh, well, with a higher self-esteem and uh, to be more confident and, uh, well, motivated uh, to create, uh, well, processes in their local spaces. And uh, what what we do, I can mention, we, we do a lot of things, and uh, together with the Ministry of, uh, of Education and Science, of course, the 70 percent of our actions confirmed uh, um, by the uh, government uh, in the governmental action plan should be uh, implemented together with the Ministry of Education and Science. This is the first time in in our history that happens that we are cl we collaborating really closely uh, with each other, and. Uh, Two uh, maybe uh, instruments that I would like to mention connected to uh, the young generation uh, and uh, also to uh, the access uh, to the culture in the regions. Uh, um, the f uh, well, uh, the model uh, that uh, well, uh, the m the model um, for the implementation of sustainable cultural development in the regions that we do now uh, decentralizing uh, so so-called Culture and Council, uh, which is a cultural policy uh, implementation organization. Uh, we are creating 10 uh, regional councils um, connected to the territorial uh, counties that uh, will uh, autonomically work on uh, the strategies for, for uh, various regions. Uh, cultural strategies for three years ahead, and defining what is uh, most important for this particular region. Also creating uh, expert boards uh, from the local experts. Only the financial uh, mm, uh, control uh, will be, um, let's say, concentrated in, in, the, in the main uh, central office, uh, so to say, uh, Council of Culture. Uh, we giving all possibilities to decide what uh, is important for this particular region uh, or for this particular municipality, and of course in double uh, the uh, allocation uh, of of uh, funds uh, for for the culture and arts uh, 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 since uh, uh, this uh, uh, this September October we're starting to implement uh, this pilot project and then uh, from the first of uh, January. Uh, well, with some corrections, uh, we start uh, this implementation uh, all over the, 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 the country. Uh, this uh, also activates uh, the local governments to be more active uh, in um, funding culture uh, because uh, there is a requirement at least 30% to, um, well, uh, to allocate uh, money for, for uh, the selected projects for the regions. Uh, the more uh, municipality invest, the more money comes from the state. So that's uh, the algorithm that we use, and it, it will be more encouraging for, for the local governments to be uh, well uh, part of, of the uh, funding uh, of their local projects. And of course, uh, I mean, uh, it involves uh, uh, more people into the culture, um, well, in the into the creative processes and so on. The second uh, uh, initiative that I would like to mention uh, is it refers to uh, the young children and, and young uh, people uh, for all ages in the schools, in Lithuanian schools, so-called uh, uh, the cultural passport. The cultural passport is a uh, very innovative uh, 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 initiative that uh, applies to the school kids. Um, well, that uh, uh, will uh, have a range of uh, uh, services, cultural services, and cultural products for free. Uh, that means that we are investing uh, money, uh, allocating special money for for for, for the school kids. Uh, to have every year, every every uh, school year starts, um, they have a menu um, containing uh, various cultural services like theater performances, concerts, educational programs in various museums, and of course, uh, free access to all museums in Lithuania. And they can uh, select by themselves what they want to uh, see or experience. Uh, both um, separately alone or uh, with the class, 
uh, or with the smaller groups, and we're encouraging uh, local governments to uh, take care of the transportation. If the kid, uh, let's say in a small village, uh, would like to see a good theater performance uh, in the capital city, so the local government has to uh, take care of the transportation. And uh, this uh, program will uh, will be applied already from the 1st of September this year as a pilot uh, project uh, for, for the kids uh, from um, uh, level one to four, uh, because this uh, program will be created for, for special age groups, like three groups. And uh, we start with the uh, age group um, one to four, and then uh, from the next year, from uh, 1st of January, we apply to all schools in Lithuania, all age groups. And uh, we see it as a really huge investment in developing a new generation, a creative thinking, uh, well, uh, conscious, uh, responsible, and um, um, well, uh, very active, uh, actively involved in the culture processes. And I think uh, this is also uh, about uh, developing new audiences because uh, I think uh, when the culture becomes uh, a, a m essential part of your everyday life, then uh, uh, you don't have to work uh, um, or to invest uh, much in the new uh, audience uh, building. Uh, it will come naturally because it will be natural need for everyone uh, to use culture every day. So uh, we have plenty of initiatives, both uh, uh, within the formal and informal uh, uh, education, but we think uh, that it's so important to invest in people, first of all, in people. And that's why we care about uh, uh, new coming generations and uh, with the uh, we care about people in the rural uh, areas or, or let's say in the regions that um, well we as in all other countries uh, the processes uh, are happening now people are leaving uh, uh, regions and going to uh, the major cities and we want to keep them more in the in these local places and to to uh, make these communities uh, stronger so uh, the, the cultural identity is about uh, to have small, uh, strong identities all over the country. Um, I, I can share uh, with you lots of initiatives that we are doing at the moment. So, so it's really a uh, lot of things uh, that uh, starting from cleaning up the ministry, uh, referring to uh, the colleague who says, uh, so, uh, stop being bureaucrats, uh, let's co-work together. And I would say, that's what we did exactly uh, as a head of the ministry. When I came to the ministry, I said, let's work together with the artists, with the, with the cultural people. And uh, we changed the, the, the whole um, uh, structure uh, at the ministry, flattened uh, as a, in, a, in the private companies. Uh, instead of three uh, um, directors or heads over, so we had only one. And uh, in we removed all departments and, and uh, from 18 uh, units, we made up to uh, 11. And they are co-working together like uh, project-wise and uh, more uh, result oriented So uh, we started to clean uh, our home to get out uh, outdoor, so to say, to the cultural fields and to make drastical changes. We want to make changes in the, in the mindset and that's why we're doing in many layers and many aspects. So if you want to share, um, well, if, the, if you would like to hear uh, more about our initiative, so, so we have plenty of time. I mean, we can meet uh, one by one and, and uh, I, I would be really, really glad to share with you. But uh, I, by finishing, I, I would like to say, let's think about the people, let's invest in people. This is about the culture. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Minister. A message we've heard from, I think, all our speakers this afternoon. So can I thank all our contributors uh, for their fantastic presentations? Uh, and can I thank you all? I'm going to hand over, if I can, again to Joanne Kendall to uh, escort you or allow you, uh, tell you where to go next for the next uh, workshops. Thank you very much.